Shalom, good morning. Hag Sameach, Lag Sameach. It's Lag Vomer all over the world. And we're celebrating here in Israel with tremendous joy. Dancing, music, festive meals, Torah. Of course, the Zohar of Rabbi Shimon. Today's Shira, entitled A Miracle for a Miracle, is connected to yesterday's story about the birth of Rashbi, and the miracles that took place around his birth, and uh, Rashbi's job later on as being a tzaddik in his generation. And this story is from the same sefer that we learned from yesterday, from Rav Benyahu of Nar Shalom, called uh, Hilula Rashbi. And in it, we are going to learn about a couple that also was not able to have children, just like Rashvi's parents. So, pay attention to the parallels and the connections, and we'll talk about them afterwards. But once there was in the ear of Tzidon, which is Tyre, which is in Lebanon today, which tells us that uh, 19, 1800 years ago, Eretz Israel was a little bigger than it is today. And there was a couple there who uh, had passed 10 years of marriage without having any children. And they did what most people did in the, that time. They went to the rabbi to ask for a blessing or a clarification. Or, in this particular instance, they asked for the rabbi to write them a get. They had already made the decision in their mind that they were going to get divorced. They hadn't had children. They knew the law that the husband is required to have children. And so they took it uh, that the Rashbi would write them a get, a bill of divorce. Which, by the way, any rabbi can write a get if he's properly trained, but not every rabbi can make a barren woman have children. So Rashbi said to them, by your lives, just like you got married with joy and a meal and food and song and dance and wine, so too you will separate with food and song and dance and wine. It's a strange answer. But he's basically telling them, well, if you're going to get divorced, you have to make a party to get divorced. Now that is a strange thing, because it's not exactly a day for celebration. But listen, and we'll understand more why the tzaddik's cryptic advice actually was the first wheel that was turning in the miracle. So listen, listen closely. So the couple went home to their house, and they did what Rashbi said. They organized a big meal. And they invited their friends. And they had food and drink and song and etc. I've never heard of a divorce party before. <laughs> Certainly not in Judaism. <laughs> but nonetheless, this is what they did. And when the husband got a little tipsy, he said to his wife, My daughter, I've looked all around our house and I want you to choose the most valuable thing in this house as a gift for this day that you should take with you wherever you go. And of course, she's planning on going back to her father's house, which is the general custom back in the day and even today. So what did his wife do? <laughs> She kept pouring him wine, and more wine, and more wine, until he got so drunk he fell asleep into a deep sleep. And then she turned to her servants and she said, take him to my father-in-law's house, in his bed. Now back in the day, most beds were made of rope. Thick pieces of rope would straddle two pieces of wood, and then they would put straw on top of that, or... Clothes, uh, fabrics, etc. But they didn't have uh, foam rubber you know, <laughs> and all the fancy mattresses we have. But nonetheless, he was passed out in his bed. And so the servants picked him up 
and carried him to her father's house, which presumably was not so far away. They put him down in, in, in a bedroom in her father's house. And in the middle of the night, he woke up and he didn't know where he was. And he looked around and he woke up his wife next to him and he said, where am I? What, what's happened? Tell me where I am. What? And she said, well, you are in my father's house. And he said, well, what am I doing in your father's house? Didn't we have a party at our house? How did I wake up here? And she said, well, you forgot your, your gift to me. You told me to choose the most valuable thing in this house to take home with me to my father's house. And you, my husband, are my most valuable gift. So I took you home with me. <laughs> I have no more valuable possession in the world than you. So, the next day, they went back to, to Rebbe Shimon Bar Yochai. And they told him everything that had happened, the party, getting drunk, waking up in a strange place, and his wife's answer, that you were the most valuable thing to me. And when Rebbe Shimon heard the story, he stood up and he started to pray, 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 that she should become pregnant with children. And afterwards, he told them, go home, go to your house, and don't ever separate. Now remember, he's the one who told him to have a divorce party. And now he's tell he prayed for them. He said, go home and don't uh, worry, don't separate. So my first question is, well, why didn't he just tell them the first time not to separate? I'll pray for you now. Rabbi Shimon certainly had the power of prayer to change certain decrees because there's several types of decrees in heaven. There's a decree that's been decreed from the beginning of time and there's a decree that's decreed according to the situations of the moment and some decrees can be removed and some can't. And Rabbi Nachman has a whole series of Torahs about decrees in heaven. Gezerot, they're called. And some can be changed and some can't. But we can't give up. And certainly if we don't know if a decree is on us or if we can be changed, we have to try. But clearly, Rabbi Shimon saw when they first came into them, why didn't he pray? Well, because they came in and they didn't say, Rabbi, bless us with children. They said, Rabbi, write us a get. So he perceived in that request that they had given up. They had given up on the miracle of having children. And if, if anybody's had children, they understand that it really is a miracle. That it's just not a foregone conclusion that two people will get together and have a baby. A lot more than that has to happen. But they didn't ask for a blessing for children. They asked the Rebbe to give them a get. He said, okay, well, you know, just like you got together with a party, you'll leave with a party. Now, part of the secret here is that when you need a miracle, you do not ask for something else. Because you're really showing God that you don't believe in the miracle. Okay, give us the get. What can we do? That's called giving up. When you need a miracle, you have to ask for the miracle. And don't get fancy. And that's important when you go to a rabbi to ask for a blessing. And it's important when you go to Hashem yourselves. In our generation, a lot of the work is on us to go to Hashem and to pray. And we're going to talk about that kind of prayer in a, in a few moments. And so a little bit of time passed and the woman became pregnant. And then, of course, after nine months, she had a baby boy that had been granted, or so to speak, granted by Hashem because of the prayer of Rabbi Shimon. But, you know, we asked that question before, well, why didn't Rabbi Shimon pray the first time? 
Well, not only because the person didn't ask for the blessing, but there was something missing in the couple. Something very important was missing in the couple, apparently. That by having the separation party and the husband getting drunk and the woman taking him home as my most precious possession, she was showing a tremendous amount of gratitude to her husband. And I'm sure that that husband felt a tremendous amount of love and gratitude towards his wife. And gratitude is the posture, is the spiritual position to receive the miracle. So, a lot of people need miracles. We know that. Miracles of children, miracles of health, miracles of making a living, miracles of all the external things in life. Money and children... And health are really about our physical selves and the state of our lives. But there's another type of miracle, the internal miracle, the miracle that changes who we are, the miracle that changes us from a not good person to a righteous person, the miracle that changes our bad traits into good traits, the miracle that makes us different. And Rav Yisrael Salant, who was the founder of the Musar movement in Europe, 140 or so years ago, he was also the head rabbi of Jerusalem at the end of the 19th century. Rabbi Yisrael Salam said, it's easier to learn the whole Gemara than it is to tra- change one personal trait, one personality trait. Because what is a personality trait? It's a quality that's engraved in your soul that you're generous or you're not, or you're strong or you're weak or you're wise or not wise. These are traits that are, are like part of the nat- our very nature. They're engraved into our software from birth and even from before birth. And he said to change one of those is harder than to learn all the Gemara. And if anybody's tried to learn Gemara, they know how hard it is. And to learn the whole thing and remember it, (laughs) that's another level. But understand, what he's telling us, and what we're pointing out here, is that there really are two kinds of miracles. The miracles that affect our internal world and the miracles that change our external world. And we really need both. But we also want to be in balance about such things. I have to identify, what's the miracle God wants to give me? Maybe it's not what I think. Because God is miraculous. His very presence is miraculous. This creation is miraculous. And the fact that He created Sadiqim like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is miraculous. And that's what the Gemara says about the difference between the Tanaim Kadoshim. They asked, what's the difference between us and the, the forefathers, we're righteous, we've served you with Mesirat Nefesh and self-sacrifice. We believe in miracles. And they answered their own question. They said, well, the difference between you, the rabbis like Rabbi Akiva, who died for God's name, and Rabbi Shimon, who ran away for 13 years in a cave because of the Torah, and Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Sarah, Rachel, Rivka, and Leah, the difference is that they saw everything as a miracle. And we see miracles as something outside nature. But nature itself is the greatest miracle. Who can create anything that even remotely compares to this this creation? So this is part of one of the secrets, friends. And hopefully we'll, we'll do a course on miracles in the coming months. Because when we understand how miracles work, we have more faith in them. And when we have more faith, then we become connected to that level of creation. That there are miracles that change us inside and outside, and we need both. And we need to ask for both. And sometimes one depends on the other. And here we see 
that there was this transformation in this couple because of the party where suddenly they appreciated each other so much more when they realized that they were going to separate. Now, as a therapist and a marriage counselor, I can tell you this is not a new story. Many, many couples think about divorce, they talk about divorce, they, they throw the D word, we call it, you know. They throw the D word around like an arrow, like a spear, every time they get angry. Oh, I'm going to divorce you. Oh, I want a divorce. And that's just pain talking. But it's also showing a lack of gratitude. And how can I expect to build something positive if I don't really appreciate my partner? So that D word is not a joke, and it's not to be used, ever. Let the lawyers use it there, <laughs> you know. But it's not for, for any married people to, to throw that around, because it's, it's, it's really a bad sign to heaven that we don't appreciate what we've been given. We might not like what we've been given. You know, I remember being a kid, and, and you know, you receive a, a birthday present you don't like. Oh, my goodness. For a little kid, it can be uh, <laughs> traumatic. But, you know, they learn to realize that that gift that they've been given might be the best thing they have. So the position to receive the miracle is often, first of all, I have to get back the gratitude. And then I realign myself with Hashem. And then when I realign myself with Hashem, I can receive the blessing. Okay. Now... There's more to learn from this story, a lot more. I've taken some notes about it, but the, the Sefer, the Rav brings here a Midrash that tells us a very interesting principle from this story. And it goes like this. Just like Hashem, He's really the one who makes barren women have children. Call the Homer even more so So that for a, a being of flesh and blood, a human being, since God said to the human race, God said, especially to the Jewish people, Ein li chafetz ba'olam tov mimcha. When the, the Jewish people say to God, I have nothing better in the world than you, isn't God going to redeem you? Isn't God going to take you out? And immediately, such a person receives the presence, whether it's a child or a miracle of another kind. When a person recognizes that it's all Hashem coming from Hashem for him, says, I want Hashem. That's what I want more than all the other blessings. So to the Jewish people as a whole, when they recognize that they don't want anything more than Hashem, Hashem's not going to redeem us. Hashem's not going to take us out of the decrees of the nations, of the decrees against us, against because of our deeds. So certainly God's going to redeem us just as He does the individual when we put our vote on Him. Over and over and over. And this is the verse from Shir Hashirim, and Negilav and Ismachabach. That whole piece is from Shir Hashirim, Midrash Shir Hashirim, excuse me. Okay, Negila, we will be joyous, is the type of joy when you have a revelation of something. There's many types of joy in Judaism. And one is when you something gets revealed to you that wasn't revealed before. That's a certain kind of joy. And v'nismacha, and we will be joyous b'ch in you. So there's that other type of joy of simcha where we we're, we're we're deriving joy from somebody else. So you see, joy <laughs> joy is is contagious. If you see somebody happy, be happy with them, because you're going to attach to that joy. What, you can, how can you not be happy if you're always looking around at other people's happiness? That's real gratitude. 
But if I'm always looking around what's missing in my life, then that's all I'm going to see in others as well. Okay, now some other interesting ideas about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai that's connected to this is Rabbi Nachman has taught us a lot about Sadiqim in his books. And not only does the Sadiq have the power in his prayer to remove the decree from a woman that she can have the blessing of children, so too the Tzadikim have powers for things like finding lost objects, even. We have a, a pasuk that we say, and we've done it in our family for 25 years. You say three times, Ama Rebbe Binyamin, Kulam Beheskat Sumim, Three times that verse, and we found lost things over and over and over. It could be your keys, your wallet, anything. Amma Rebbe Binyamin, and Rebbe Binyamin said, everybody is as if they're blind until God open their eye, opens their eyes. And not long ago, I was looking for the spices to make Havdalah, and it was right in front of my eyes, and I looked everywhere except in front of my eyes. And that's a, a very small example, but, you know, Hashem has to bless our sight to see what we need to see when we need to see it. Otherwise, it could be right in front of you and you won't know it. Your blessing might be your husband or wife right in front of you and you don't know it. We have to open our eyes. So that's a verse that we say, and that becomes in the merit of this, this uh, Tana Rebbe Binyamin, who has many other things that he said in the Gemara and uh, of worthiness, and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to learn more from him, because he's given a very powerful teachings, Rabbi Binyamin. And also, we know that the tzaddik, his job can also bring to, to, his job is also to bring new soul into the world, which might be a baby, but it also might be a new soul for you, because each time you transcend to a new spiritual level, you're getting new soul power. They're not separate things. There's a new you. It's like you were operating at Windows 7 and all of a sudden you got Windows 10. But it's the spiritual Windows. <laughs> okay? You're getting a new download. And that's soul. And don't be mistaken and don't let the psychologist tell you, well, you know, it's self. And the, and the, and the philosophers will say, no, you don't know what soul is. And, the, and everybody's going to try to talk you out of your blessing. Don't let them. When you get new self, you get new soul. And when you get new software to approach, to, to filter the world, that's also new soul. And the tzaddik's job is to bring that down to you. Why? Because he already has it. And a lot of times, to receive that blessing of a new self or a new soul or new software, whatever name you want to give it, it's because I remove something old first. That there's something blocking. That's why a tree can't get bigger unless it, the old bark is removed. But once the bark is removed every spring, then the new bark can grow on and the tree gets bigger. Surprise! So this is one of the, the paradoxes of, of growth in Judaism is not getting more. It's first removing the old to receive the new. So Rabbi Shimon has these powers. And we said, remember, that there's two kinds of miracles. The miracles that change our inner self and our outer life. And when we change our inner self, we get that inner miracle. All of a sudden, the outer miracles start to happen too. And they're linked. Now, I love talking about miracles because they, it brings them closer into consciousness. But if you talk about it too much for the wrong people, <laughs> they might think, oh, this guy's just trying, he, he's not in reality. Well, okay, so you have to be a little smart about these things. But there is another great irony in this story in comparison to what we said at the beginning of the, of the talk, that Rebbe Shimon came into the world when his parents couldn't have children, and now Rebbe Shimon's job is to give other parents who couldn't have children the blessing of having children children. So you see, it's me to connect me to over here. It's a miracle for a miracle. You want to come in the world, Rabbi Shimon, when your mother was a barren woman who was not supposed to have children, but because of her tears, she changed her own inner self. 
her own inner blessing and connection to creation, her prayer changed her. But this wasn't any t- just normal prayer. This is copious tears, crying, where, you, you know, you feel like you're going to die. And I've seen over and over through the last 30 years of trying to pray that it's those prayers that, like, you just really can barely walk afterwards. That's when the miracles happen. Because you're in a sirat nefesh in prayer. You're giving up your old soul to get a new one in prayer. And so Rabbi Shimon, he got the job, you know. <laughs> and it's like heaven saying, I brought you in the world through that miracle. Now you have to do this miracle for others. You have to bless and pray for other people. So there's a lot more ironies to be said about these things. Um, I know it took me a while to figure this out, but my parents uh, were convinced to stay married by a rabbi. They were on the way to get divorced before I was born. And a, a rabbi in 1960 convinced them to stay married. And I was the result of that reconnection. And it's very ironic that 40 years later, my job is trying to be a marriage counselor to help people save their marriages. Uh, It's like I have a little spiritual debt there. Otherwise, I might not be here. (laughs) So you see, if you want to, if you look at your life closely enough, you'll see that these things exist. That the the things that happened to your parents, that what happened to my parents is, is a sign for me what I've got to do in the world. So if you're confused about what you're here to do in the world, look at your parents' life. Look at what they had to go through. Their struggles and their blessings. Because there's something there for you. You know, these teachings the rabbis give us, they're not just true sometimes. They're true all the time. And when we learn our own lives and the, the ironies and the parallels and the connections... then we're able to translate that into knowledge, self-knowledge that becomes God-knowledge. The knowledge of what I'm here to do. And all of a sudden, life has purpose and meaning that it didn't have before. Now, it takes a little courage, it takes a little blessing, because some people don't like looking at their parents. (laughs) Bechlal! Much less the things that happened before. Because a lot of people have been traumatized. But we have to accept that there's something meaningful and purposeful inside the trauma and the suffering. Otherwise, who would want to be in this world, which is a world of miracles? So Rabbi Shimon fulfilled that in his life. And all of us, I think, have something to learn from that. Now, I want to change gears and to bless everyone. To have those eyes to see your life as God sees your life. Because when you do, they get opened. And when they get opened, things change, inside and out. Now, over the next few days, we're going to be transitioning to our new Patreon page. And all our Torah classes will be offered over there in a new format. And there'll be a lot more offered. We're going to be doing some uh, master class seminars on various subjects. So we're going to have interactive learning one-on-one with me and we're going to have um, a meditation workshop, a writing workshop. And so it's going to be a very interesting period for us because we're trying to really reach out to the larger world. Is there any world larger than Facebook? I, I didn't hear of that. <laughs> but we're going to continue every morning on Facebook with a... a shorter class, but we're going to keep in touch with everybody and continue our connection and hopefully we'll be uh, also see you on, on patreon.com slash Avram Shira. So come check us out. There's going to be live videos. There's going to be recorded videos and uh, who knows what the future brings. So God bless all of you. Hag Sameach. Enjoy the day wherever you are. You don't have to go out and make a big fire, just a little fire, and put the hamburgers on there. 
you know, it's it's our day to celebrate the tzaddik that Hashem gave us and the tzaddik that's in each side inside each of us. All the best, Hak Sameach. We'll see you tomorrow, Erev Shabbat, with more Torah from Eretz Israel. All the best.